Other announcements uh, that you'll find helpful to read when you have time, but if you would now turn with me in your Bible, Romans chapter 8. We are working our way through this one chapter over a six-week period. I hope you're enjoying it if you've been with us. If this is your first time, you'll find this to be just as helpful, just this section today. Uh, Romans 8, 12 through 17 are the verses that we're going to read. This is God's Word. Therefore, brothers and sisters, we have an obligation, but it is not to the flesh to live according to it. For if you live according to the flesh, you will die. But if by the Spirit you put to death the misdeeds of the body, you will live. For those who are led by the Spirit of God are the children of God. The Spirit you receive does not make you slaves so that you live in fear again. Rather, the Spirit you received brought about your adoption to sonship. And by Him we cry, Abba, Father. The Spirit Himself testifies with our spirit that we are God's children. Now, if we are children, then we're heirs, heirs of God and co-heirs with Christ, if indeed we share in His sufferings, in order that we may also share in His glory. Let's pray. Our Heavenly Father, we pause again as a very clear sign that we need you. We need you now to speak to us. This is not just an academic exercise to gather information into our heads. Uh, Lord, we want to be changed by you. It's about relationship with you, and uh, we need you to make that possible again today that we would actually hear you say something into our lives that we need to hear. And so help us to be open and receptive and attentive to whatever your Holy Spirit would say to us now. We pray in Jesus' name. Amen. Okay, so in this series so far, um, which I, I just love this chapter, I'm loving it more as we go through it together, um, we have seen that the real key to change, because we've said this series, we've labeled it, um, living a new life in the same old world. And by that, what we're trying to say is we know uh, at the beginning of every year, everybody's kind of conscious of, well, I make this resolution, I want to change my life in this way or that. But we know that real change has to happen in the context of a lot of things that don't change. Your circumstances a lot will not change, even though God is going to call you to change. Your job situation, your family situation, your, your neighbors, your, your friendships, your relationships, a lot of those things won't change even though at the very same time God is going to change you. And so we know that that's that dynamic between those two, but we also know from this chapter the real key is not about just trying harder. You know, I give you some platitudes and then you go try as best you can this week. No, this chapter is all about, we said, the person of the Holy Spirit that anybody who really is going to change is going to need power beyond themselves. And this is, the, this is the incredible promise that God gives us, is that he himself will cause a change in us that you could not accomplish on your own. We've said that God is one God. We worship one God, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. And a lot of times we focus on the work of the Father, the work of the Son, Jesus Christ, but the Holy Spirit's a mystery. Well, I hope that you're starting to get a better sense of the person of the Holy Spirit and what the Holy Spirit does, because in this chapter so far, we've already recognized two things important. If you and I are going to change, the first thing we said was, you and I know that God says, I know that in the process of changing, you're going to fail. You're going to mess up. And you will never, ever change. Change will not take hold in your life if you and I are constantly trying to manage the condemnation that comes when we mess up. We get stuck in guilt. We get paralyzed by this sense that I'm condemned because I tried and I messed it up again, yet again. And here the Holy Spirit, the work of the Holy Spirit, overhears the conversation between the Father and the Son. The Holy Spirit says the Son is your advocate in heaven. The Son is the one who died for you. And if you receive His sacrifice, the Son stands up for you in the courts of heaven and says, Father, you must forgive 
This son or this daughter of mine, they trust in me, they put their faith in me. You must forgive them because in me, their debt has been paid. Their sin has been paid. The Holy Spirit takes and hears that conversation and comes to you directly and says, therefore, there is now no condemnation for those who are in Christ Jesus. Remember that? Two weeks ago we said, do you hear the Holy Spirit telling you, you're going to mess up this year? Christ has already paid it. That's why you can keep trying, keep going, because Christ has already paid. No condemnation. But then greater, even still, is that the Holy Spirit doesn't just kind of come from a distance and draw near. Last week we read how God doesn't just come close to you, God comes in you. This is, again, an incredible thing. I know it's, it's unbelievable for folks, but what it means is that God is not just out there or even close telling you what to do. God is in you through the Holy Spirit, giving you power that you did not have before to do what he calls you to do. God not only tells you what to do, but he gives you power to do it. The Holy Spirit, mysteriously, I don't understand it either, but I know it's true that the Spirit, the moment that you said yes to Jesus, the moment that you surrendered your life, trying to be good enough, self-righteous enough, and you said, no, I receive what you've done for me, Jesus, I trust in you, that moment that you, that you prayed or received Christ, you received the Holy Spirit. I lived for years as a Christian without fully knowing that that happened. But once I began to become aware of that, it was like, yeah, the Holy Spirit was there. The moment I said yes to Jesus, he indwells the believer. So it gives us power. But today, we see how that power gets worked in our lives because we have to understand the foundation for change. There is this power to change, but the foundation for all change in our life comes from a kind of a key word for today, identity. How you think of yourself, your view of yourself, plays a crucial role in whether you and I are actually going to continue on in the transformation process. So we learn, and this is what you already sang about, that when you are in Christ, that is that you've received his righteousness for yours, you've accepted him as Savior, you are now a child of God. That is your identity. Identity is really crucial because we take our identity from what people say about us. Now, this works both ways, but for instance, just think of it this way. If you were the only people that I were ever around, and, and every day I was with you, and you all thought that I was the most handsome guy in the world, just go with me on this. I mean, I know that's a stretch, but let's say every time I came in, every one of you, I'd come in and you'd say, oh, Cliff, how are, man, you are a good-looking guy. And I'm like, wow, okay. And the next person comes over, oh, just, you are, you are so handsome. It's unbelievable how good-looking you are. And you, I kept doing that. I'm a little surprised at first. And as I'm walking by, I hear somebody else whisper, you know, oh, if only I could have a nose that big. You know, and it's just so handsome, the, the looks on, if only I could have ears that flapped in the breeze like yours do, Cliff, you know, and if you continually told me that, how long do you think it would be before I actually began to see myself as a pretty good looking guy? It really wouldn't take that long. At first, there's a lot of skepticism, oh, go on, you're just being nice, come on now, and after a while, no. They consistently say it, and after a while, my identity, my self-image begins to take on what everybody else is telling me, and I begin to see myself as a handsome guy because of what people say. This works, of course, in reverse. And by the way, the more important the person is to you in your life, the greater the impact they have in helping to shape your identity, your self-image. It works in a negative way. Because those of you who have had a parent, the closest person that you know from the beginning of your life, and if that person has not constantly told you how beautiful or handsome you are, but if that person has, in abusive ways, told you that you are worthless, that you are a mistake, that I don't know what good you are for, and you hear that enough times, you tell me, does that have a dramatic impact? on the way that somebody sees themselves, some of you are living this even to this day. 
where you hear that voice in your head that tells you you are worthless, you, you don't, you're not worth the time of day, and you hear that, and after a while, you can't help but believe it. And suddenly, you act as if you're worthless. See, the foundation for our actions is always identity, always. You don't even think about it most of the time, but we always act out of who we think we are. If you tell a kid enough times, he's a bad kid, you're a bad kid. Doesn't that become this self-fulfilling prophecy after a while where suddenly they start to act in the exact way that everybody tells me I am? It's all about identity as the foundation for how we act. Identity can seem really unimportant, I know. I know sometimes we get into these messages and people are like, Cliff, give me something practical. Monday is coming. Tomorrow's coming. I got a thousand things. Give me something practical. I know this doesn't seem like that, but there is nothing more practical because all of your actions flow out of your identity. So here, God is telling you. He tells you from his word. If you are in Christ, you are a child of God. Not one day I hope that you'll become a child. Now, if you're in Christ, you are a child of God. Why are you telling us that, God? Because the foundation for your transformation, you got to believe this. You have to know that you are a child of God, and it will take time. I, I know that maybe the best example for me, if you know some of this from the Bible, you know, remember the story of the nation of Israel? They were slaves in Egypt for hundreds of years. This is right before you get to Moses. Remember all that stuff? Israel are slaves in Egypt. How do you go through your day as a slave? How's your image? How's your identity? Well, you're actually told. You're not even a person. You're property. You belong to me. You will do as you're, as you're told. You're a slave. You're nobody. You're nothing. Not just for a couple of days. I mean hundreds of years. The collective psyche of a nation begins to say we are slaves that's who we are and here comes a god who suddenly and this is the amazing thing to me do you know how long it took god to get israel out of egypt one day one day it all it only took god one day to get israel out of egypt that was the passover the angel of death comes and then he brings him out and he brings him through the red sea it took one day for god to get israel out of egypt it took God 40 years to get Egypt out of Israel. What I mean by that is that for 40 years they wandered that desert. You're like, why did it take so long to get to the promised land? For 40 years, God spent hammering into them, you are no longer slaves, you are free. And that by day one, it was true, they were free, but they still thought like a slave. They still ate like a slave. They still acted like slaves. Every response in their life was conditioned by slavery and it took God one day to get him out of Egypt but 40 years to get slavery mentality out of them and that's the way God works it with us in a moment you can be saved today if you did not know Jesus Christ you can receive Christ right where you're sitting right now before we get to the end of the service where we do an invitation you can say to Jesus yes I know what you've done for me and I'm tired of trying to do religion I want to know you and in that moment you are saved but I want to just tell you, it's going to be a long process of change. Some of you are like, 40 years, is it going to be that long? It, it, that might be short compared to what God is working in some of us. It may take even a lifetime. It's going to take a lifetime of God working this change. But it is worth it. And God will be relentless, and it's always a starting point. Well, God, where do we start? Do you know who you are? You're a child of God. You are no longer slaves. This is what the text tells us. Those who are led by the Spirit of God are children of God. And the Spirit that, that you receive does not make you slaves so that you live in fear again. But then these things start to come to light with this process of changing us. This is how God works it. This is what you'll start to notice. Children of God, once you begin to really grasp that identity, learn to live in joyful obligation. That sounds like an oxymoron to some. How can you have an obligation that is joyful? If you're obligated, that doesn't sound like it would be joyful, right? Well, that's because I think there's actually three ways to think about this word obligation. The first two are negative, and the third one is the one I think that Paul is actually referring to when he says, we have an obligation as children of God. We do, but let me understand this properly. The, the first way you can think of obligation would, I, I, would be what I would call social 
pressure. You may have just experienced this at Christmas. How many of you send Christmas cards? You send Christmas cards out to different people, a few of you. When you do that, you may have experienced this. You send a card out, maybe to lots of different people, but then everybody get a card from somebody that you didn't send a card to? What happens in that moment when you get that card in the mail and you know, I didn't send them a card, is there even a little bit of obligation that begins to rise where you say, oh man, I I need to buy them a card. I I gotta get them a card. I can't not send them a card. They sent me a card, right? There's kind of this social pressure. It's even worse if they give you a gift, right? Oh my word, I didn't get them anything. I got them absolutely nothing. And now there's this social pressure, this, this sense that if I don't respond, there's an obligation almost to respond. But I would say it's negative in this sense. It's mostly built on either pride or guilt. You're doing it because, one, you don't want to look bad to somebody else, or you're doing it because you just feel this guilt inside you, and so the motivation is pride or guilt, not the best motivation to do an obligation. There's also another kind of obligation that's not good, and it's not as free as the first one. As bad as you feel for getting something from someone you didn't give them anything, you still have a free choice. But there is an obligation that we would call slave obligation. Ask a slave, a true slave, are you obligated to obey your master, your taskmaster? And they would say, yes. Well, you shouldn't feel that obligation. Just feel, I don't have a choice. There's a whip on my back. There's this actual, not just a social pressure, there's a physical pressure. There's a presence that says you will suffer if you don't, and you are compelled to do it, You're obligated in that sense, but that's out of fear. There is a really good obligation. When Paul says, we have an obligation, this is the type he's referring to. And uh, we're children of God. The best example is the child-parent relationship. If you've had children or you've got kids about this age, I don't know what age they get to swimming nowadays. They tend to toss babies in pools and take pictures of babies floating in pools. I, I don't know how that works, but they do that. In my day, it was more when they'd get, I don't know, what, four or five years old, and the kid's at the pool, and a parent wants them badly to learn how to swim, and not only just to learn to swim, but to enjoy the water. And so a parent has a couple of options. Some of you told me stories of how you learned to swim, which was your dad picked you up and threw you into the water, and you're still alive, so I guess you learned how to swim. We're grateful for that. Here you are. Um, but that's one way to do it. A dad could say, well, you'll learn to swim if I throw you in. But the best way is when the parent gets in the water, and then they say this, come on, jump in, jump in. Now, as soon as they do that, they're actually placing the child under a certain obligation. The, the child will actually feel this. Oh, Mom and dad's calling me to come in. I, I should, but there's a lot of fear here. I'm afraid that if I jump in, I might die. I might go under the water. I, I'm fearful of the water. And, and so there's this conflict of, here's a parent in the best cases. This is a parent that I love who is telling me that it's going to be okay if I jump in, but they're not forcing me to. They're not throwing me in. They're actually just coaxing me. They're putting me under a certain obligation, but there's a joyful obligation when the kid realizes I can jump in, and it is okay. They actually don't do like, you know, I, this is why my kids probably wouldn't have ever done this. I, I can't swim, so it didn't work out this way, but I would have probably been like, I will, I will catch you, I will catch you, and then couldn't resist the, I'm not going to catch him, just to see what happens. That's a bad idea. That, you break trust, right? But when the parent does it right, and the kid knows, I was scared, but I did it because I know there was a love that made the fear seem smaller, That's the obligation. You and I can have a relationship with God, and he is not going to throw you in the pool. He won't. I know there are days you wish he would. I wish God would just do this for me. But God is coaxing us with love. He's saying, trust me, I will be here for you. And the day that you jump is a big day. Because suddenly you realize, not only was it okay, but I would have missed out on a world of joy if I had not taken this leap. And suddenly, the next time God says, come on, jump, I will catch you. You're like, I think I can trust God, and it becomes a joyful obligation. You still feel a little bit of that fear. It's so different than a fear-based motive. 
I, I was always skeptical of this joyful obligation because my parents, before they were be- Christians, when we were growing up, we, they'd say, I want you to go do this. And I would say, why? And they would say, because I said so. And that was code for, you're about to get whooped here if you don't go do this. So the motivation was what? Fear. Can I just tell you right now, some of you, the reason that you have not really experienced change is primarily because you are not thinking like children, you're thinking like slaves. And the reason that you hear God's voice, you hear God say, I want you to do this, and you say, why should I do that? You think you're hearing God say, because I said so. I'm bigger, stronger, more intimidating than you. I could whoop you if I need to. And that is not how God does it. The Holy Spirit brings this joyful obligation of coaxing. So, as we do that, we learn to live in security, not into fear. Here's this idea that comes out also in verse 15. The spirit you receive does not make you slaves. He's not going to approach you like a taskmaster so that you live in fear again. Rather, the spirit you receive brought about your adoption to sonship, and by him we cry, Abba, Father. That's a great picture, isn't it? That's a good-looking guy right there. That's our granddaughter, Evelyn. She visited with us over Christmas. I know you you guys didn't get to see her, but uh, it was a beautiful time, and it was just amazing. Um, Something that happened um, with her reminded me of this passage here where it says the Spirit does something in us in terms of changing our identity into children, I don't know what you think of when you think of children. When you hear children of God, we sing children of God. You think of like, I don't know, an eight-year-old child of God. I guess I, I'm like a child of God that way. I think the text is actually drawing us back further. Infant, let the little children come to me. And Jesus uh, placed his hands and blessed those little children, like infants, like babies, because there's something that a baby does that even a 3 and a four-year-old stops doing after a while. I experienced it. I was sitting on the couch here with Evelyn. We're reading a fascinating book about zoo animals and stuff like that, and we're going through this, and I'm reading it to her. Oh, look, zebra. zebra. That's all it says on that page. I need to write children's books because I'll tell you, I think I can pull it off. Zebra. And she'd look at it, and then out of nowhere, I didn't ask her, I didn't prompt it. She, she's sitting on my lap looking at the book, and suddenly she just turns to me, and she does that. She just throws her arms around me. I'm like, you don't even know me, you know? I mean, she, she doesn't even know. Here's this kind of most basic thing that a baby does is to reach out, and at the same time, this is a neat thing, Evelyn said her first word when she was here. Um, I mean, she's kind of always been in the, when she gets upset, ma, 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 ma. We weren't sure if that was mama or what, but she said her first real word, And if you're like, well, what was it, Cliff? What was this great? And she whispered it every time she said it. So it was like this holy moment, you know. She was in the inner sanctum or something. And what it was was puppy, puppy, puppy. You know, we're all like, yeah, what about Mimi? What what about Grandpa? What about, you know, Grand Poobah, an awesome one? She hasn't said that yet to me. But puppy, puppy. And she was very clear. She wasn't looking at the fire hydrant anymore saying puppy. She was, it was a puppy, her first word. The thing that they say about the first words of any child is that what? It, it's very simplistic. It can't be a, a word that uses words that, that are pronunciation that requires teeth because they don't have any. So it's usually a mama, dada, papa, or abba. See, a- abba is an Aramaic word. It's a word that people say, well, I know it means father or daddy. It's kind of an affectionate term. It's more than that. It goes back to the very first way in which a human being reaches out for someone that they don't really know, but they trust. They say, Abba. It is the most intimate term because it's the first cry of the human heart. It's what a baby says. In Aramaic, it's the same as as papa or dada or mama. Abba, it's intimate, it's close, it's real. By the way, it's only used three times in the entire Bible will you find it. And the first time that you find the word Abba, it's spoken by Jesus, the Son, to his Father. And you might think, 
well, that's got to be a hallmark moment like this, right? You know, you get this great picture. And can I tell you when Jesus said, Abba, Father, when he went back to the most fundamental way in which you relate to your heavenly Father was when he's in the garden, when Jesus is wrestling the night he's going to be betrayed, when he is under such stress that he's sweating blood, he's under that kind of stress. And in that moment where he says, Father, I don't want to have to go through the suffering if there's any other way, but not my will, your will be done. He says, Abba, Father. He's telling us, remember, this is what it means. If you are in Christ, you are born again. That's what the scriptures say. You are born again. You become a child of God, an infant who begins again to learn, wow, Abba, Father. Somebody told me, Cliff, you should eat this up because it doesn't last. They get to even to be three or four years old, and it's not Abba, it's what? I do it. I, I do it. I, I don't want, it's going to take forever for you to get your shoes off. I do it. I do it. Somewhere along the line, we lose it. We, we, our sinful nature begins to kick in, and we begin to say, God, I can get through this. I'm just going to work harder. If I have a total meltdown crisis, I'll call on you, but I do it. And instead, Abba, Father, is the exact opposite of that. It's saying, God, I need you now in the most fundamental way. When somebody criticizes you and you are hurt and you say, well, what do I do about that? Because now these hurt feelings rise. Do I just say I shouldn't be upset? You know, just say no to being upset today? That doesn't work, does it? The first thing that you've got to do is begin to say to yourself, I'm forgetting who I am. I'm forgetting my identity because the reason I'm so devastated, not just hurt, but devastated by what somebody said is because I've been drawing my identity from them, from what they think of me instead of the most important person in my life. And if you're a Christian, the most important person in your life is now Jesus Christ and what he thinks of you and what he says about you. And so now when I'm hurt, I begin to preach to myself, I'm forgetting that I am a child of God that I belong to him, that what he says about me is the most important thing, not what others might say. Does it still hurt what they say? Yes, but it does not destroy me or devastate me. I have to remember who I am. And when you can't feel the strength to do it on your own, a preacher to your own heart, the beauty of this text is it says the Spirit also testifies with our spirit that you are a child of God. And when you think you don't have the strength to do that, the Holy Spirit comes in and says, that's what I'm here for to remind you, you are a child of God. And until you believe that, you will never change. You can't until you know who you really are. Lastly, let me just close with this. There's a great transition verse here. We'll pick it up really next week. But verse 17 says this, Now, if we are children, if you've received Christ, if you have the Holy Spirit in you, dwelling in you, you are a child of God. If we are children, then we are heirs heirs of God and co-heirs with Christ. Now that verse goes on to say, and that means we also share in his suffering, and then sort of the rest of Romans 8, if I say this too much, you won't come back, but the rest of Romans 8 is about suffering. It's about, it's, we always say, Romans 8's a great victorious chapter. It is, but it talks a lot about suffering. It says, if you are going to be connected to Jesus in such a personal way, buckle up, because you're going to suffer. Get ready because you're going to suffer with him, but you're also going to be glorified with him. You are going to be changed. You will not be the same at the end of this process. So there's an inheritance. Well, what about this inheritance? Slaves tend to think only about the moment. Can I get through the day? Can I avoid punishment? How can I manage my fear? And the fear keeps you focused on the moment only. You rarely see a slave who has long-range vision or hopes or dreams because they just want to make it through the day. But a child who lives in love begins to have this ability to think not only about the day and live fully in it, like kids can do. You know how kids do? They play hard, they live hard in the moment, and they just sleep hard because they're in the moment. But they also are looking ahead. Because you see this with kids all the time. A kid sees mom and dad driving, 
What do they want to do? Oh, they want to drive. They make little toys, you know, that you can pretend you're driving. And Why? Because I see the people that are most important to me, the people I love, the person I love is driving. It looks like it's a, a good thing to do. I want to do that. They see dad out there mowing the lawn. Why do they make little plastic lawn mowers for kids? Because I see dad doing that. I want to do that. I want to be like him. Why do they make little shopping carts for kids? Why do they do that? Because I want to be like mom or like dad. I want to I grow up and be more than I am right now. Well, what's that going to look like? It's going to look like the most important person in my life. I want to be like him. For the Christian, this is the thing. That means you want to have an ongoing desire to be like Jesus so that when you're reading your Bible, does this happen? You're reading and Jesus shows this tremendous love to, say, an outsider, someone that the culture is says is a throwaway person, no good, not important, and Jesus comes alongside and loves them. And as he does, does this kind of hit your heart where you're like, well, that's great. Jesus is amazing. He is so amazing. But it also is meant to rise in you a certain inheritance that you say, you know what, I don't do that very well, but I want to be like that. I want to love people like that. When you see Jesus getting spit on and mocked and beaten and then turns and squarely faces them and to say, Father, forgive them. And you say, wow, that's fantastic. That's am- Jesus is amazing. But it also ought to raise a part of your heart that says, I want to be like that. Jesus, I want to be like you in every way. This is the inheritance. It's not just what God can give you. It's who God is making you that is part of this inheritance that Paul says we have. I'll close with this. This story always just um, reminds me of this, the fact that in New York City, there's lots of missions that reach out to the, the poorest of the poor, those who are really hurting the most, alcoholics, drug addicts, prostitutes, people who are homeless on the street. There's this mission that, that goes out. They don't just wait for them to come to them. They go out on the streets. And I remember this one guy ta- talking about this, saying that, well, what do you do when you sit down next to a guy who's an alcoholic, who's been living on the streets, stinks to high heaven, you can't even hardly get close to him because of the smell, but what do you do, what do you say? And he says, this is what we do. We sit down with them, we hug them, and the first thing that we say is not, hey, buddy, you better get your act together. Your life is a mess. Now, is that true? Yeah, it's true. But the first thing that they say is this. They say, you are not acting like a child of God. You were made for better than this. Your identity is what has to change first. If you don't see yourself as a child of God when you come to Christ, no change will ever happen. They attack it at the very foundation. And the question I have for us today is, do you believe that? Do you really believe that you are a son or daughter of the God who created everything, and that the love that he has for you is powerful. It's honest and truthful, yes, but it is powerful to change you, but it's going to take a long time to break you out of your old identity. And the question is, are you in for the long haul? Are you ready? Because God wants to take you there through the power of the Spirit.